Good morning. While we're uploading my presentation, let me start off by uh, thanking the organizing committee and uh, Mr. Chairman for your kind introduction, for inviting me and my wife over to uh, your beautiful country. Holland will play Costa Rica later on tonight. We could have played Greece. I still would have enjoyed that much better. Um, then again, I hope that all the, the Greek people will now be cheering for Holland, of course, after that dramatic loss against uh, Costa Rica. Uh, I will be wearing an orange cap tonight, so I will be uh, easy recognizable because I get, will get rid of the suit and will be much more relaxed, I hope. Um, before I start off, I just want to know what the audience is I'm talking to. So who of you are doing endoscopies in patients with GERD and Barrett's? Raise your hand if you're doing endoscopies. Okay. And who of you have, Barrett, have seen a Barrett's patients over the last year? Either clinically or on endoscopy. Okay, thank you. So the whole issue relates to the rising incidence of esophageal adenocarcinoma. The incidence of that disease has increased sixfold over the last decades, and in the Western world, it's the cancer with the fastest rising incidence. Generally, esophageal adenocarcinoma presents at a symptomatic stage when the tumor is big, when the esophagus is obstructed, when the patient cannot swallow his food, has lost a lot of weight, and it's generally a disease of the elderly patient. So symptomatic patients generally present with a poor prognosis. They either have metastasized disease or surgically irresectable disease. The only chance for cure for a symptomatic esophageal adenocarcinoma patient is a combination of surgery with or without chemoradiotherapy. And that's a pretty invasive therapy with a risk of mortality. 50% of patients have significant, com uh, significant complications of that treatment. And even with that combined approach, the overall survival, depending on how you select your patients, is somewhere between 20 and 35%. Well, the risk for adenocarcinoma increases with the severity of your GERD symptoms, like in this New England paper. So if you have symptoms multiple times a week, and if your symptoms are severe, and if you have had these symptoms over a longer period of time, these are all risk factors for esophageal adenocarcinoma. And the most important intermediate factor between GERD symptoms and esophageal adenocarcinoma is this disease state. This is how it looks on endoscopy, a salmon-colored distal uh, esophageal epithelium named after Norman Barrett, an Australian who moved to England at the age of three and who found this disease to be related to esophageal adenocarcinoma. Uh, we need the combination of this endoscopic appearing mucosa and these results in biopsies, intestinal metaplasia. So it's metaplastic tissue that has some features of gastric mucosa but also some features of bowel mucosa. And this metaplastic tissue is better resistant against symptoms, but is also more instable, instable and therefore at a higher risk of progressing to cancer. Now your Barrett's patients have a much more severe reflux state than your normal GERD patients. They have longer reflux episodes, they have long, and, and they last for longer, and they are more severe in terms of symptoms. The chance that you will find a Barrett's esophagus upon endoscopy increases with the duration and the severity of the GERD symptoms of those patients. So if a patient has more or less daily symptoms for a period over 10 years, then if you do endoscopy on those patients, about 20% of those patients will have Barrett's, whereas if these symptoms are relatively short duration, the chances of finding Barrett's esophagus are likely to be much lower. As I said, it's a risk factor for cancer. This is a normal Barrett's esophagus, and here you see already an advanced cancer that has developed within a Barrett segment. Why is Barrett's esophagus then so relevant? Well, it has to do with the opportunity to detect early cancer at a curable stage by keeping the patients under endoscopic surveillance so that they progress to dysplasia or early cancer that we can still treat them before they progress to really invasive and advanced cancer for which we generally are more equipped to do palliation than to uh, provide them with curative treatment. 
the risk of getting cancer in Barrett's is really very small. It's been exaggerated, I think, by the earlier studies that had a relatively low number of patient years and then found a very high risk, but with the increase of larger series, the larger the series become in the number of patient years, the lower the cancer risk becomes. And the current estimate is that about 0.3% of all Barrett's patients will proceed to cancer per year. It means that you have to do about 300 annual endoscopies to find one cancer case. Management of Barrett's relates to the management of their symptoms and also to the management of their risk of cancer. So in terms of management of symptoms, a Barrett's patient needs the same approach as your normal GERD patient. So you strive to get rid of the symptoms and to have their esophagus heal. However, Barrett's patients generally have a much higher acid exposure than the average GERD patient, which means that for symptom control, they meet, may need higher dosages of uh, PPIs. Well, the endoscopic management relates to surveillance. And that means you inspect the esophagus for visible abnormalities, and if you don't see anything, you take these random biopsies. And based on the endoscopic appearance, and the results of these biopsies, you then classify the patient as having no dysplasia, low-grade dysplasia, or high-grade dysplasia. No dysplasia probably now means surveillance every three, probably even every five years, depending on other risk factors like length of Barrett's. Please don't scope these patients every year. That's an unnecessary burden for them. It makes them worry too much about the disease and just generates unnecessary costs. Low-grade dysplasia you need to confirm if it's truly low-grade dysplasia. The average pathologist has difficulty making the diagnosis. So if a pathologist tells you it's low-grade dysplasia, you should ask him before you do anything to have this diagnosis confirmed by a second pathologist. If you go downstairs for my lecture in the gastroenterology group, I will explain you more in detail why that is. But don't accept every low-grade dysplasia from a community pathologist as true because 80% if they are revised by an expert pathologist, are downstage to non-dysplastic Barrett's. Inflammation and dysplasia are difficult to distinguish. So good management of low-grade dysplasia means confirm the histology first. Leave the patient alone, work on the biopsies. And then if, the, if, the, if low-grade dysplasia is confirmed, this patient is at a much higher risk for progressing. And therefore, the guidelines say that you have to survey them after six months and then annually thereafter. And there are even studies that suggest that you may prophylactically ablate these patients, provided that the confirmed diagnosis is repeated at multiple times. High-grade dysplasia and early cancer, of course, we're not going to sit and wait for the cancer to progress to an advanced stage. This is actually where we do our treatment. This is where we do the surveillance for these patients' need endoscopic treatment. Now, finding dysplasia in Barrett's is difficult. Early cancer, especially with this project projection, is barely visible. And high-grade dysplasia, low-grade dysplasia really are endoscopically very difficult to distinguish from a normal Barrett's. And of course, we have good quality endoscopes nowadays with high-quality CCDs and a movable lens so that we can combine magnification and optimal um, um, focusing of the instrument so that we can find very small areas of high-grade dysplasia if we spend a lot of time in a Barrett's esophagus. We can add stains to improve the detection, use sophisticated techniques like autofluorescence endoscopy or narrow band imaging, which are filter techniques that improve the visualization of this lesion. But the bottom line is you just have to look longer with a good quality endoscope. The best quality, higher definition endoscopes are good enough to do the work. But you need to take your best endoscope. So don't use a fiber optic instrument or a poor quality video endoscope if, you, if you're surveying a Barrett's patient because you want to detect early cancer. And early cancer is difficult to see, so you need your best endoscope. And then all these techniques with chromoendoscopy, I think for routine use, are relatively unimportant if you spend time, use the best endoscope, and stick to certain rules, certain rules like don't immediately start biopsying, because if you take two biopsies, it becomes a bloody mess, and you don't see anything. So um, we'd much rather have you spend more time and biopsy less than quickly doing 
20 biopsies in a 15 minute time slot in an unsedated patient. This is just not the way how you find early neoplasia. And you need to know where these lesions are in a Barrett's esophagus. We know that reflux has a spatial distribution occurring more between the 12 and the 6 o'clock, the dorsal part of the esophagus. And we know for early neoplasia that falls to actually the same circumferential extent. So most early cancers occur somewhere between the 12 and the 6 o'clock position, like these examples. Another part where early cancer is difficult to detect is in the transition between the Barrett's esophagus and the ahetal hernia. These two patients have cancer. But based on the endoscopic appearance, just looking forward with your endoscope, you will miss them. So this is why you have to read to flex the instrument. Here's the shaft of the instrument. And here you can see the two cancers these two patients had. And again, three small cancers. This is where we're looking for if we're doing Barrett surveillance. These patients can be cured by an endoscopic approach. And then we need to train our endoscopists. These are all cancers that you can see even with this resolution. My two kids, when they were six and eight, recognized all cancers without ever having had an endoscope in their hands. They didn't recognize any of these three, and especially with this projection you probably can't see, but this is an early squamous cancer, here's an early Barrett's cancer, and here's an early gastric cancer. A lot of these early lesions are difficult to detect, but you have to recognize them. It's not a matter of seeing because the endoscopes are good enough. It's a matter of endoscopic recognition by the endoscopist. So a couple of examples of early cancer. I will skip through them because I don't think the projection will allow me to bring over these teaching points. Okay, so then endoscopic treatment. We don't need surgery and very invasive treatment with the related morbidity and mortality that I told you about. If we can just do this endoscopically with a low morbidity and mortality that preserves the esophagus, provided that the lesions we resect don't have any lymph node metastasis. That's why we need to detect them at an early stage when they're still at a mucosal level. Here's an example of how we do that. Let, I hope that this works. So this is a five centimeter Barrett segment with an early cancer, again, in that retroflex position. We mark it with electrocoagulation, then we use a needle to inject fluid underneath to lift the lesion up from the deeper layers, and then we attach a small transparent cap with a snare in the ridge of the cap. We suck in the lesion and then strangulate the lesion with the snare. So here's the lesion now captured in the snare, and then we cut it. And then we inspect the wounds. You see there's no more markings. And then the histopathologist tells us if this is a mucosal cancer that we can still treat endoscopically, or that we can if it's a submucosal cancer, that given the risk of lymph nodes, this patient still needs an additional surgical treatment. This EMR specimen guides our management. And then the, su the subsequent management relates to uh, getting rid of the whole Barrett's. And here, the, the most best researched ablation tool is radiofrequency ablation. It's a circumferential device with a balloon. This is real time. This is what you do if you cook the inside of a Barrett's esophagus. And then by giving the patients high-dose PPIs, this tissue then regenerates. You get rid of the Barrett's. You get left with small, some small islands that you then can patch up with a small RFA, focal RFA catheter. And this video, I think, sh should show you how this then works. So this is the follow-up of that previous patient that we did, that endoscopic resection. Here's the balloon placed in the esophagus. The balloon is expanded and we suction down the esophagus to optimize contact. And then within three seconds, the whole Barrett's segment of three centimeter is ablated. We generally do that two times in the same session. And then the patients are under high dose PPIs. In our, in, 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 in our hands, they get isomeprazole, 40 milligrams twice a day. They get ranitidine at that time for two weeks, and they get sucrophate three times a day. We don't want a single proton to enter the esophagus. And if you then come back after three months, there's some small residual islands that you then can ablate with this focal device. So here we see, you see how we have ablated some of the residual barrets. And this is then how it looks when the treatment is done. You would not have guessed that this patient ever had a Barrett's esophagus, and you would have not have guessed that he had a cancer. And this is eight years after treatment. 
So it's a combination of endoscopic resection, find the weed in the grass and then cut it away. And then once you've got confirmation by your pathologist, then burn away the rest of the grass for a complete resolution of the Barrett's. And I think with the modern tools we now have, we can achieve complete remission of neoplasia and Barrett's in over 90% of patients. Thank you very much for your attention.